So welcome everyone. Uh, the big question is, are you ready to live on Mars? Um, as I uh, thought about this question, I thought, you know, I wasn't so sure. And then with all that's going on on our own planet, I thought an escape sounds kind of nice. Um, a little housekeeping, please use the chat box to introduce yourself and say where you're from if you haven't already. Uh, also, please feel free to use the chat box to ask any questions during the presentation. And we'll be watching those questions and answering when we're able. Um, and then there will be time at the end for uh, Q&A as well. Uh, I am Corey Newman. I'm the Executive Director of ELCA Schools and Learning Centers, and I am honored today to be hosting this webinar that will introduce you to a free web-based resource for classroom use that is highly interactive and aligned with current standards and skills expectations. Um, our lead presenter today is Kai Stotts, the project lead for CMOC. I will let him introduce his amazing panel and then take you on a journey of discovery. Kai, the floor is yours. Thank you, it's uh, an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting us to give this presentation. Um, as, uh, as noted by the topic, we're gonna be discussing how to live on Mars, uh, a little bit less emphasis on how to get there and more emphasis on how to, how to uh, actually exist there. I'm not sure that it'd be much of an escape uh, since we're trying to get out of isolation um, and, uh, and, and I think living on Mars would be even more isolation. You would never get to leave your building unless you're in a spacesuit, but uh, that, that may work for some of us. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm very honored to be here with Gretchen Hollingsworth and she is a uh, classroom instructor at the Barrow Arts and Sciences Academy in Georgia. And also with uh, Tyson Brown, who is the editorial director at National Geographic. I'll give a brief introduction to myself and then hand over to Gretchen and Tyson. Um, so I worked in supercomputing, in Linux operating system development. Um, I worked as a documentary filmmaker and traveled around the world capturing stories of people in many different countries and continents. And uh, for the last half a dozen years, I've worked as a, as a researcher, principally focused on exactly what we're going to talk about today, which is um, how we become an interplanetary species. And I'm currently sitting at the, the world famous is Biosphere 2, um, north of Tucson, Arizona, where I am a director of research for the uh, for CMOC and SAM. And SAM is, is right behind me. Um, we're actually building a physical Mars habitat analog here, and research teams from all over the world would be welcome to come and use that facility uh, to, to help us prepare to become interplanetary. So Gretchen, on to you. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm Gretchen Hollingsworth. I'm a teacher at Barrow Arts and Sciences Academy in Winder, Georgia. I've been teaching for 20 years and I've taught grade levels 6 through 12, um, primarily uh, the middle grades for science and 6 through 12 for, for my English background, but I'm currently teaching English, but I, I was fortunate enough to be a beta tester of CMOC in my classroom when I was teaching 6th and 7th grade science, and I also used it in an eighth grade classroom. And, and we will talk more about that later, but I'm so happy to be here. Thank you all for attending. And Tyson? Uh, my name is Tyson Brown. I, um, as uh, Kai said, I am the editorial uh, director for the resource library at the uh, National uh, Geographic Society. We produce materials that uh, share the experiences of our explorers, as a means of hooking and exciting kids into studying um, uh, the, the uh, work that they do and, and to learn about the, the, the uh, subjects that they need to study in, in school. And uh, we do that by preparing teachers uh, with our own uh, approach to pedagogy. Um, I've worked in uh, school publishing or educational publishing for a little over 30 years, starting at the National Science Teachers Association um, working on their journals and later their books and uh, website. And now I lead the uh, team that develops the underlying architecture, uh, the content and, and, and manage the production of materials that appear on the resource library. Oh, there we go. I was muted. Um, and I had the, the pleasure of working with Gretchen now on, uh, I think this is our third project together, second or third project together. Um, all three of us, including Ezio, who, uh, who just commented, is our lead developer of the CMAR product. We were all part of a paper that was published at the International Conference of Environmental Systems um, this year, which is really fun to show how we're using CMAR in the classroom. We'll come back to that in a bit. So I would like to, um, to, to jump in to just kind of get our 
get our mindset for what it means to live on another planet. So I have a short presentation. I know we've all sat through tons of slide presentations this year, but if you can handle just one more, I promise it'll be short and fast and not too much, uh, not too much reading. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, so here we go. And again, this is just to kind of whet your appetite for, um, for what it's gonna to mean to, to get to Mars, to live on Mars. So I'd like to start off by just acknowledging that getting to Mars really is rocket science. There's a lot of calculus, a lot of math involved. Uh, it's, it's, you have to think about the incredible audacity of sending a spacecraft from Earth to another planet for, it takes about seven months moving at tens of thousands of kilometers per hour. Um, and they're able to land on that other planet millions of miles away within a few meters of where they expect to land. It's absolutely phenomenal, blows my mind. But we're not doing rocket science today. Um, instead, we're going to be talking about living on Mars, which is really science that we can all understand. Um, it's a little bit of chemistry, a little bit of ecology, a little bit of plant, you know, plant and animal husbandry. Um, it, it's really much simpler in terms of, of the maths, and it also is much more tangible. It's what we're already doing here on Earth, but in a microcosm. And so we're really going to be focused on, um, and, and CMOC itself is, is focused on air and water and food and waste, mostly human waste, uh, we get to talk about pee and poo a lot when we talk about space travel and, and also thermal, which is just keeping us at the right temperature so we don't freeze or we don't overheat. Um, and so that really brings us down to that fundamental question of how do we sustain human life in hostile other world environments? And that's typically encapsulated in, in the NASA lingo that's encapsulated as, as environmental control and life support systems, otherwise known as ECLIS. It's actually a little bit more complicated than just air, water, food, and thermal, but that, that's most of it. There's a few other things like volatile or um, organic compounds we have to control, et cetera. So we have a fundamental question of whether we want to do this with mechanical systems or the, whether we want to do it with plant-based systems. So all of our life support on earth is principally done with plant-based systems. And as we know, we've kind of messed up those systems in the last couple hundred years, and we're paying the price for that now and wondering how do we get out of the mess that we're in. Um, but when you're looking to the future of living on Mars, and this is a, a rendering by my friend Brian Beersteg, we will be probably a combination of both mechanical and plant-based systems. And so as our favorite movie, The Martian, um, <laughs> you know, Matt Damon's character uh, was, was really growing potatoes once again uh, in poo and, uh, and, and Martian regolith as an attempt to survive until he could be picked up and taken home again. Um, and that is an example of, although not scientifically accurate, it's an example of how someday we will be able to, we hope, be able to use some of the resources available to us on Mars to reconstruct some of the environments that we take for granted here on Earth. So back in 1987, the construction of the Biosphere 2 was initiated, and there were eight people who lived inside this 3.1 acre facility for two years. Um, it was an absolutely incredible experiment, um, and contrary to the popular media, it did not fail at all. There's incredible science and wonderful research and, um, and, and publications that came out of this experiment. And so that's actually where I'm located now, and I live here five days a week, um, and will be, for, will be so for the next couple of years um, as we build our Mars habitat here. So this was the world's largest and definitely the most sustained sealed experiment, hermetically sealed, as a demonstration of how we might live someday um, on another planet. But also, or more importantly, it was an, an, uh, coming to an understanding of our relationship with the ecology and biosphere one. And that to me is equally, if not more exciting than going to another planet, is having a better understanding of where we live now and, and how our actions affect the ecology and the environment around us. So as you, as you know, the space station is entirely mechanically driven. It's entirely mechanical, uh, meaning that all of the air, the water, the food, the waste is all recycled um, with machines. And this is a ground-based approximation of the equipment that handles that on the space station. Fairly complicated and very expensive to repair because all the parts have to be flown up at something like $7,000 per kilogram to lift any component into orbit. This is an experiment called Lunar Palace One that was conducted by Beijing University. And this was in the opposite of the space station and much closer approximation to that original Biosphere 2 experiment. There were four individuals that lived inside the completely sealed environment for up to eight months, reliant fully on plants as a means of recycling their air and water and generating their food. Now there were some machines involved. Obviously there's tubing, there's conduit, there's, uh, there's water and lights and such, but they're claiming about 99% 
um, closure of that facility, which is a really good experiment towards a much closer future of, of other world exploration. And this I really enjoy, and I won't spend too much time on this, but, uh, and, and these slides and, and all this is actually available online, or I can give you these slides in particular, but this really shows you kind of that closed loop function. And if we look at, you know, the crew, the crew requires food, some salts, um, and, and we need, uh, we, we have water that, that really goes through a recycling um, function. Let me see if I can hide this again. Just um, so the water goes through recycling function of, of going from condensate back into a treated water and becomes um, potable water again. We have then human urine, which is treated, and this actually make its, makes its way around back into drinking water again. The human feces is partially derived, partially um, treated as solid waste. But here's where it gets interesting is that we have what's called inedible biomass. Essentially, that's the broccoli stems that nobody wants to eat. Um, it's the parts of the plants that we grow that we can't consume, often the leaves of fruiting bodies. Well, there are other animals that eat that, such as yellow mealworms. Uh, crickets are a good one. Um, mycelia, which is the root structure of, of, um, of uh, mushrooms, they will all eat that and turn themselves into something we can eat. So in this experiment, you can see that worms were part of their diet. And again, there's a lot of detail here, but it makes you really think about what it's going to mean to live in that completely sealed environment. So I won't go into the details here, but in CMOC itself, which is a Mars habitat simulator, it's a computer model that has an educational web interface to it. So you don't have to memorize all this. All this is running behind the scenes, but this gives you a feeling for the detail of data that is driving this educational interface and, and science exp experience. Um, and so it's really important for us, and I think for the citizen scientists, the classroom instructors, and your students who are using CMOC to understand that everything we did is based on real data coming from NASA and 40 years of research in human physiology, human metabolism, and plant structure, uh, plant functions. So we've got all this data in here of how much oxygen we need, how much water we need, how much food we need, and how much carbon dioxide we give off, water vapor, urine, and waste, et cetera. And this is what plants look like um, to, to a, a computer model. We've got wheat and cabbage and chard and celery, and it shows you how much oxygen they produce, how much carbon dioxide they require, how much light and water, et cetera, they need, and on average, how fast they grow. All of this data is in the model. Again, no test at the end of this. Um, this is just everything that we integrated in from, again, 40 years of published NASA data. So what it comes down to, and this is the really fun part about CMOC where I think the students, and Gretchen will attest to this, is where the students get really engaged. Although it seems like kind of geeky and nerdy at this point, it's actually quite fun. You get to choose what you want to bring to Mars, to the moon or Mars. And so let's say we had these selections available to us. We have cabbage and we have sweet potatoes and onions and wheat and tomatoes, et cetera. Well, if we look at it from the point of view of a computer model, the cabbage, the strawberries, and the wheat have very different functions in terms of their ability to take the carbon dioxide that we breathe and give it back to us as oxygen, which is exactly what happens in Biosphere 1 on, on Earth today. So the cabbage and strawberries serve different functions for our diet. But if you look at the wheat, it's far superior at what we call CO2 or carbon dioxide sequestration, 2.5 grams per hour per, cube, per square meter of wheat compared to 0.7 or 0.3 with cabbage and strawberries. And sweet potatoes, tomatoes, and onions are also very different, but you can see the sweet potatoes are very similar to the wheat, 2.5, 2.5. The difference being that the wheat, the, the wheat takes several months to grow, and we, because we're not bovines, we can't, or ungulates, we can't eat the wheat directly. We have to shuck the wheat, we have to process the wheat before we can actually consume and get something nutritious out of it. Whereas a sweet potato, as Matt Damon did in The Martian, you can grow potatoes and eat them directly the moment they're pulled out of the ground. So if you had a choice, as the Biospherians did 30 years ago, you're gonna plant sweet potatoes. They actually end up planting sweet potatoes everywhere and their skin turned orange because they ate so many sweet potatoes. So that's, um, that's the crash course. Usually that's about an hour presentation. So I know that I went through it very quickly, um, but I, I would like to give you now a, uh, a demonstration of CMOX so you can get a feeling for how this actually looks and feels. So this is where you first log in. And so this again is hosted by National Geographic. 
And so thank you, Tyson, and your team for uh, both the funding to make this possible for last year and a half, and also for making CMOC freely available uh, to the entire world. And I have to give a shout out to Nat Geo's educational portal, which has more than 4,000 freely available applications for use in the classroom or by any citizen scientist anywhere. An absolute wealth of information, interactive, engaging applications of which CMOC is just one. I'm sure uh, Tyson will talk about that in a little bit. So we're going to log into this and I'm going to sign in as a guest to demonstrate that you do not need to provide any information. You don't need your first name, your last name, your email, nothing. Um, you just log in and get going. So we're going to go to our first, oops, got that one. So we're going to go to our first screen. So this screen is where we choose whether we're going to do a preset or a custom uh, configuration of CMOC. We're going to start with a preset. And so we're going to do the one human preset on Mars. We're going to choose a mission duration of 10 days. A crew quarters, we're going to choose the small crew quarters, one inhabitant and just 100 kilograms of food, which is more than enough um, for, for 10 days. And we're going to choose no greenhouse at this point, and I'll explain why later. So we're gonna be fully reliant on the mechanical life support systems, which I mentioned earlier. So this will be like being on the space station. So if we come over here to the graphs, you'll see that we are producing, and as we change the number of solar panels, we would see, we'll see this increase or decrease, which we'll play with a little bit later. So we are producing more than electricity than we, when we need. So right now the crew quarters consumes about 2.7 kilowatts per hour and the, um, the rest of the, uh, the systems require about 5.9. We can also go to the layout in which we actually get to see uh, what our habitat looks like at this point. And this is a relatively new addition that Ezio and our team has introduced and this is really fun. So you actually get to spin around and take a look at the habitat. And if you change the number of solar panels, which we'll do later, you actually see the solar panels increase if you change the size here. In fact, we can do that right now. We'll have some fun with this. So if we change the crew quarters to a medium, it gets a little bit bigger. And if we put it back to, uh, to a small, then it gets smaller again. So you really see what you're building in real time, which is cool. So we're going to go to the one human preset again, and we're going to go to launch simulation. So I'm going to walk you through this again very quickly just to give you an introduction, and then I invite you to watch some of the tutorials online and just play with it. You can't break it. There's no right or wrong. You just play with it and learn as you go. So a lot of that data that I was showing you earlier is presented in this particular panel. And as we move through this, we can either let it tick by uh, where one hour is represented by one second of our time, or we can speed it up where it's two hours per second, et cetera. I'm going to slow it back down, and I'm going to actually pause it and move through just by scrubbing through. So here we see the energy being produced by the solar panels, and there's a little bit of energy consumption. This side of the graph is now. This is the current time here. And so if we switch, for instance, over to, um, if we go to a consumption breakdown, panel, this shows you the amount of electricity being used by each of the components within the uh, simulation. For instance, right now, our solid waste aerobic bioreactor, which is handling human waste, and our um, the uh, it's a post as a purifier, water purifier, that is uh, taking 0 0.0212 kilowatts, relatively low. So as we scroll through, we'll see these are each of the functions, again, taken from a an actual this is what you would actually do on Mars. This is from real equipment developed by NASA or uh, the Paragon Space Development Corporation that we've incorporated those functions into the model. So in here, if you watch carefully, the carbon dioxide we really want to keep close eye on because carbon dioxide is very is toxic to us if it gets too, uh, too high. So we want to keep it at 0.1%, um, which is approximately a little bit less than or about 1,000 parts per million. So this represents the CO2 being removed. And as you can see from beginning to end of the simulation, it's about the same. It's not all that different. The only thing that changes is that our food goes down from 100 kilograms to about 85, and our battery drains during the night and then it gets charged during the day. So not terribly interesting, but very informative. So now I'm going to go in, I'm going to end this simulation, and I'm going to start a new one. And we're going to choose a different preset. This time we're going to do one human and one ra and radishes. So this doesn't mean one radish. It means we have the option of choosing as many radishes as we want. So we're going to go down. Again, we have one human, small crew quarters, a 100 kilogram, basically freeze-dried food, astronaut food, 
um, and the small greenhouse now. And in that greenhouse, we are planting 40 meter square meters of radishes. So you can see that in the totality of our greenhouse, we've chosen this many radishes. So we really have a lot of room left, but just for the sake of a good science experiment, we're just gonna change one variable at a time. And uh, the layout looks about the same. So we're gonna go ahead and launch this simulation. And this is where it gets really interesting. And I think Retchen will attest, this is where the kids get engaged. They start to see the challenges and also the rewards of designing their own Mars habitat. So as we go through, initially it looks pretty similar. There's the solar energy, um, there's the consumption, but you can see this is quite a bit higher now. So this energy is consuming longer. Why? Because we have lights and the lights are to grow the radishes because on Mars, there isn't enough uh, sunlight to grow most food cultivars because it's so far away from the sun. So this is depicted as radish. You can see 7.2 kilowatts, meaning the lights that, that allow the radishes to grow. Okay, so we're gonna go through here and here's where it gets interesting. I want you to watch the greenhouse plant growth monitor. So right now the radishes are about 9.3, 9.4% mature. They're growing each day, a little bit each day. And watch what's happening. The bottom of this curve, this bottom of this CO2 monitor is beginning to show a bell curve. And the amount of time that the CO2 scrubber, which is the machine that's removing CO2 is activated, is becoming less and less. So what's happening? And now the CO2 scrubber is only turning on for just a moment, just barely turning on and our CO2 is going down. Well, look at this, the radishes are 75% mature. So they're growing up and becoming mature plants. And as you know, plants take in CO2 and on average give off oxygen. So we just noticed that the CO2 scrubber, the mechanical device that was otherwise cleaning the Air Force the same way it does on the space shuttle or did on the space shuttle and does on the space station, it's no longer needed. The atmospheric cleaning is done entirely, the CO2 scrubber is done entirely by the plant. So this is what we just demonstrated is transition from mechanical to bioregeneration, from machine-based life support to plant-based life support with just 40 square meters of radishes. And this is highly accurate. This is really the number of radishes that would actually work if you wanted to put yourself in a room with 40 square meters of radishes. The Russians did this back, um, a Russian uh, research team did this back in the 60s with wheat. They had a giant room with, back then they had to use, I think, kerosene lanterns, like these really bright, um, uh, high temperature lanterns, and they put humans inside of a room with just wheat to see if they could get that cycle, just like we've demonstrated here, and it worked. So even the biosphere itself was built on some of that initial research um, by those Russian teams. So as we move through this, through this simulation, something just happened. Our CO2 sequestration just stopped, completely stopped. Well, what happened up here? The radishes are gone. They were just harvested. So they went from 100% and if we go through one step at a time here to zero. Well, if we go back up here and we take a look at the biomass, so here's the edible biomass, edible and inedible biomass, and it's at 11 kilograms, and the radishes are still in the ground. We're now gonna, when that radishes are harvested, about five and a half kilograms is being moved from the garden into the food supply. And so the food supply went from 62 to 67 kilograms. So we basically just pulled the radishes out of the ground and prepared them to eat. Now we don't have the radishes pulling in that CO2 anymore. And once again, we're reliant on machines. So that is showing you that the whole life cycle of one plant and one human in a sealed environment and the relationship between that human and those plants. And I know this sounds, this looks super geeky. There's no animations, there's no first person shooter, <laughs> but it's really fun to see the kids get into this. And I can't wait for, in just a moment, I'm gonna hand it over to Gretchen. She'll tell you what her experience was, um, which we find is, is common amongst all of the, uh, the schools that have used CMOC. This kind of engagement, which is, has been just fabulous for the students because they're doing authentic science. They really are building a foundation of, these are the variables I have at my disposal. These are my first, this is my hypothesis. I think that I can, I can get a human to survive with radishes and carrots and celery and wheat. And this is how many of each of those I'm gonna put in place. Let's see what happens. Oh, the human didn't make it. 
So then they might change the variable a little bit and they go back and they run the simulation again and they run the simulation again and they take notes. They're becoming scientists engaged in that independent variable modification one step at a time until they get to the point where they find a balance between the humans and the plants. And I'm gonna show you one more quick simulation. And this one is one that doesn't quite work. And this is what's really fascinating is that it doesn't always work. This one's gonna take a little bit long, longer to launch just because it's a more complete simulation. Hopefully my internet's still working, there we go. Okay, so in this one, I'm gonna to go to the greenhouse config or the greenhouse configuration. And now you can see we have onions, red beets, radishes, strawberries, cabbage, wheat, and still some empty space. And we're gonna go down to plant growth and you can see all the plants. This is where it gets really fun. So now you've got four humans and immediately, almost immediately, we don't need the, or I'm sorry, I should say immediately the, the machine that is the, the CO2 scrubber, it's not even keeping up. You can see our CO2 is way above the nominal 0.1% and it's still climbing. It's going up and up and up. And the humans are in danger of CO2 tox, you know, toxification. Well, but just about when it gets to be too high, it starts coming back down because the plants are maturing. And sure enough, the radishes, the first ones there, the radishes grow very fast. So the, the radishes to the rescue, the humans made it through what would have been a dire situation. If they reach a certain level, the humans don't make it. But then if we go through the simulation, we see chaos. And this chaos is because now there's not enough humans to support the plants. There aren't enough humans to supply the CO2 to keep the plants alive, and now we've reversed it. We used to be concerned, do we have enough plants? Now we say, do we have enough humans? So this is where there's really, it's a very complex environment. But if you change just one variable at a time, you can find a balance between all of these. And in future versions that Ezio and Grant and our team are working on, we're going to allow you to bring in CO2 from the outside Martian atmosphere. There'll be even more ways that you can mitigate, more ways that you can make this system work. So that's, that's it. I, I know I'm going through this very quickly. Um, but usually, again, usually this is an hour long, <laughs> hour long demonstration. Um, and so I do want to just close by showing you um, that on the CMOC website, which is simoc.space, uh, we have a wealth of information. We have all of the literature review, every publication we read to make this possible is linked on our website and actually downloaded and hosted on our website so you don't have to go find it somewhere else. Um, there's a link to the National Geographic Educational Resource Library. Um, there's an introduction to formal learning with this project. Uh, there are classroom examples of which includes uh, Gretchen. And we have the classroom lessons, which was written by a former um, curriculum developer at NASA Johnson Space Center named Don Boonstra. And it is next generation standards aligned. And we have one set for 538 and one set for 914 with slight differences in terms of the level of engagement. Um, and I will close with a statement that for advanced students, and I, and I won't even name a grade because I think there's advanced students at all levels, um, all of the data that you produce in the simulation can be downloaded and you can analyze it with traditional graphs and charts or you can put it into a machine learning algorithm and you can really start to see those correlations between the different variables as you apply those, those machine learning algorithms. So there's a lot of depth here and a lot of breadth. Um, and for those uh, maybe advanced, really advanced students, we also offer a local installation of CMOC on their own computer such that they can actually start developing their own strains of wheat, for instance. Maybe they want to experiment with a GMO of a carrot and they can introduce a carrot that has different functions than your off-the-shelf carrot um, seeds. So you can actually modify and build your own agents as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Gretchen. Thank you, Kai. Every time Kai speaks, I learn so many new things. You're brilliant. Um, and I, CMOC is brilliant. Uh, I've used it with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders and have had success every single time and all different results. So um, first I want to share, I'm gonna put it in the chat, the presentation that I, or the slideshow that I used with my students. And now I'm going to share my screen. and hopefully bring up the right thing. Here we go. All right, so uh, CMOC in the classroom, I 
as I said before, I was fortunate enough to beta test this with my students. Um, and the opportunity came right before COVID hit the world. So I had not implemented it in my class. And then we went into lockdown and virtual learning for the first time ever. And I had to decide, am I going to use this? Am I going to postpone? And I decided we're going to use this. Um, engagement was at an all-time low with students. But one thing students love is space. So I decided to capitalize on that and integrate this in my classroom. Uh, as Kai showed us, there are wonderful curriculum materials available on the CMOC site, and that's what I use to develop basically a modified hyperdoc for my students to progress through independently at home. Um, to access them, just as, as Kai showed us, you go to the CMOC website, research and education, classroom lessons, and I can't say enough good things about uh, those materials. They are very well developed and very thorough. So I started my little hyperdoc with an engaged question, what problems would we face if we wanted to inhabit Mars? I pulled a, a, a video from National Geographic and the students were able to just progress through this at their own pace. And you can see some of the responses to just that first engaging question. Uh, students brought uh, prior knowledge, um, not as in-depth as the knowledge they were able to gain after completing this activity, but they definitely showed interest and understanding of what it, some of the challenges, some of the challenges. So then as you can see through these slides, these are basically things I took directly from those curriculum materials and just threw them in this Google slideshow. But we, we advanced with this guiding question, how can I use the CMOC model to develop a habitat to support life off world. And so I, I gave them a little bit of an introduction, again, pulled directly from the CMOC site. Um, and students were able to just consider some of the challenges. It's not as easy as Hollywood would make us believe. And so um, students were able to, to look at some of those things. This is another resource that I pulled from the site and students um, were able to look at this problem that we have. Um, what are these constraints that they need to consider? So again, they just jotted down their, their thoughts and they progressed through the slideshow. And here are some of the, the comments that they included in their products based on the reading that they had done. You can see we don't have unlimited resources. I need to make sure we don't run out of oxygen, uh, the cost of the materials, and um, they even consider things such as the, the human's mental stability while living on Mars. So to help them narrow down their focus, it just kind of brought it back around to some of the basics. Um, these were sixth and seventh grade students who, used this particular hyperdoc. So um, I know all states are different, but in Georgia, sixth grade students uh, study earth and space science in sixth, in sixth grade, and then seventh grade students study life science. But the great thing about CMOC was it applies to everything. So I was able to use the same presentation with both grade levels. So then um, we, we took a look at how could we design a habitat that would actually provide life support for these researchers on Mars? And um, how do we design an environment that promotes health and emotional support? And honestly, I, I didn't know what I was gonna get from these students. Like I said, engagement was at an all time low. Our district had announced basically that we were going to follow the grace over grades mentality that you know students would not be penalized if they didn't complete work. So you know, it was, just, uh, it was just a risk. And I had more students complete this week long project than I had complete anything else that I had posted for them in Google Classroom during that time. So I think that speaks volumes to how valuable and engaging CMOC is. So anyway, moving on, I provided some guiding research type questions 
Um, and on the actual slideshow in Google Slides, there were some, some websites to help guide them in their research. And, you know, just basic things like what is, what's the temperature like? What's the terrain like? How does Earth produce clean water and recycle and pure water and help them make connections from their class content to, to this project? So then we moved on to designing a prototype. And again, I had no idea what I would get from these students. And you'll see as we look through some of the examples, some are more, more developed than others. Some students did uh, drawings, some students developed a 3D rendition and they had fun, they clearly had fun. Um, you know, could, would our Mars habitat look exactly like this? No, but the important thing was this student at home was thinking about what it could be like and, and building and creating and connecting. So I just loved all of these little ideas that they came up with. Um, and you can see some are, some are definitely better than others, <laughs> as is the case in education, but all are valuable. We'll progress through the rest of those. So um, after they created their ideas, then they were tasked with actually going into CMOC and testing their, their ideas or their designs. And so um, one of my favorite, well, there's so many things I love about CMOC, but one of my favorite things, and Kai mentioned this, is they do not have to put in an email. They don't have to put in any personal information. And that's important as a teacher to not have to worry about students creating an account. They could go in as a guest as many times as they want, but in more advanced cases, they do have the opportunity to um, create an account and save their data or download. So I, I think that's wonderful. So basically I wanted them to test it at least three times and reflect. And again, wasn't sure what I would get. And you can see through these, uh, by looking at these student examples, um, some made deeper connections than others. Uh, some were able to um, you know, just reflect and see why things didn't work the way they had intended. Um, and then others, you know, had just, you know, very basic connections and that's okay because we have all different levels in the classroom. And this is a mixture of sixth and seventh grade responses as well. There we go, talking about urine again, Kai. So urine was way too low compared to how much a person produces each day on earth. And so, you know, just little things like that. And then they have to start thinking, well, why? And um, just, just reading through all of their responses was very enlightening to, to just seeing how their minds work. So of course, with all good projects, we like to reflect. And so I had my students uh, type up a reflection, but also record it via Flipgrid. And we weren't sure how well the video would play. So it's linked in that slideshow if you would like to watch it later, but it's really great hearing the students just explain the connections they made and how they felt it was beneficial. So, um, so that was how I used it during virtual learning. And then last school year, I was teaching eighth grade physical science and I had the students in person. Well, most of them, we had, um, we still had digital learners at home. So we would broadcast live via Google Meet and, um, but we still had students in person. So. I didn't get to use CMOC as a, a whole week thing or a whole unit project, um, but I did use it as an engage activity to basically drum up some excitement about the, the Perseverance rover and its landing on February 18th of this past this year. So um, we just watched a little video about that and we briefly discussed um, some of the constraints that, that we would face when trying to develop a habitat on Mars um, by watching these videos. But this time I was able to actually see the students as they were running through their sim simulations. And the experience was way better just because 
you get, they were so excited and just hearing their little comments to each other and, oh, my humans died and, oh no, I've lost power. What's wrong? And, and they were engaged the entire time. And I'm telling you that rarely happens <laughs> in a classroom. You know, they're dipping. Nobody was checking their TikTok or their Snapchat. They were in CMOC running these simulations. And like Kai said, they might not be um, super gamified or, or have all these graphics, but that did not matter. Although I will say I do like the, the new addition with the habitat view, it's, it's amazing. But here you can see the students running through their simulations. Um, and then when we pulled it up on our, we have these clear touch interactive TVs in the front of the room. And so they were basically fighting over the chance to come up to the board and demonstrate simulations for the class. And so you can see something about having it on a big screen made it even more exciting for them. But they had a blast and see these two students, I think they were arguing over what they should do next. And it was great. It stimulated great conversation, um, ideas for the future. And um, overall, we just had a wonderful time getting excited about science, making connections in all different subject areas for that matter, and just understanding the the interdependence of life and, and everything that goes into that. So, um, so all in all, I give CMOC two thumbs up, absolutely. And that is basically my experience with it so far. I'm, I'm teaching English this year. Um, and so I'm, I'm brainstorming ways I can still integrate it in my class. And I, in fact, I had a, a friend ask just the other day, how can I um, do STEM in an eighth grade language arts class? And so I said, well, <laughs> you can go into CMOC and you can read a little article and annotate it and then have the kids go in. And, and so um, there, there's just so many opportunities to use this wonderful tool in your classroom. So thank you. Back to you, Kai. Thank you, Gretchen. I, I don't think I'd seen a number of those photographs. I, I want one of those big touchscreen TVs. I think that that's fantastic. Um, Tyson, up to you now. Uh, I think it's appropriate that I open with this slide because we we're talking about uh, leaving the Earth behind to go to, to the moon and Mars. Um, uh, obviously, National Geographic is very interested in what's here on Earth. Um, and one of the things that we try to do is to use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling mm -hmm. to illuminate and protect the wonders of our world. How we translate that, uh, that um, goal is um, into our education strategy. And what we believe is that young people and educators who reach them are the key to addressing the planet's most pressing problems. And National Geographic's resources, tools, and experiences for teachers, students, and youth will help them to develop empathy for the planet and set them on a path towards being the next generation of change makers and planetary student stewards. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that through movement building, and we achieve that by igniting a large, diverse, global community of, of kids, what we call Generation Geo, Gen Geo. Um, that connects and inspires and accelerates young people on their journey towards solutions. And we equip those young people with an explorer mindset um, through the co-creation of high quality content programs and experiences that enhance their ability to participate, lead and take action. We support young people to develop, expand and practice leadership competencies um, that augment their influence and impact. And if we do that, then we will effectively catalyze an inclusive solution-centered movement in which young people have empathy for the earth and the agency collectively to act. Game-changing tools and experiences like this, like Map MapMaker, uh, like other uh, programs and tools that uh, National Geographic makes available through uh, its resource library, they engage students in deeply exploring a topic through the use of authentic data, which they can manipulate and run faster than real time as Kai showed you in his demonstration. And it's uh, also about field building, which is about training educators to use our learning framework and our explore mindset 
with their students, which will be needed to meet our ambitious goals. As you can see, 2.5 million educators, 100 million youth and 5 million youth leaders by 2030. So we've got very ambitious goals. In order to achieve those goals, we're taking a multi-layered approach. We develop high quality content following our learning framework of that, that, is, that shares the attitude, skills, and knowledge that build and explore mindset. Uh, we offer a geographic perspective. We offer subject matter in five focus areas that I'll share in a moment. And uh, we offer geographic tools, skills, and uh, uses. These follow our design pillars, which are to establish a geographic knowledge and learning, to elevate missing voices, to use geographic inquiry to inspire thinkers and change makers, and to move learners from knowledge to action. We offer a range of professional learning from micro learning that's built right into our lessons to full on seven to 15 week courses. And we pro provide immersive experiences such as virtual field trips, augmented reality resources, and photo camps, and CMARC, which uh, we are excited to feature in our resource library. I mentioned earlier that we are uh, narrowing our focus to five thematic priority areas. Uh, this has come out in the last year, so it's relatively new to us. But we're focusing on oceans, land, wildlife, human history and cultures, and human ingenuity, which space travel and space simulations fits in perfectly. We do that through a variety of resources, including the resource library, which I've mentioned. Uh, that is a repository of about 4,500 assets, so which range from encyclopedia articles to uh, infographics, videos, maps, of course, at lessons, and a whole, whole range of, of great content. We also offer uh, an Explore Classroom, which is a, a place where kids can meet directly with an explorer from another part of the world and talk about his or her uh, uh, areas of, of study or focus, or the things that they're trying to protect or learn more about. Uh, and, the, and thousands of kids uh, participate those, uh, in those on a weekly basis. We offer mapping resources. Um, so you can buy physical maps. You can buy giant maps. If you want something for your gym or your classroom, you can utilize our um, online mapping tool, MapMaker, which is a, a simplified uh, RGIS uh, tool where you can pull in data from all kinds of resources and display them in your map so you can really explore those geo questions. We also provide materials for younger kids, uh, Explore Magazine, uh, which has nonfiction uh, articles that uh, kids who are just learning to read can engage in. We offer um, all kinds of Learn Anywhere resources. So uh, after school, on the weekends, with your family or caregivers as you're traveling the country. We offer those online courses that I mentioned earlier and micro credentials, as well as uh, aligning everything to our learning framework. And I'll close. I accidentally closed into, went into our website. <clears throat> Hang on, I'll come back to our presentation. I can figure out where it is. There we go. <laughs> this is great. I will just close just by saying that uh, we are super excited to work with Kai and his team and his mom and the, the good folks who have joined us for this presentation to feature uh, CMOC as uh, one of our re resources. We uh, are, our CMOC, uh, excuse me, Kai has been very, uh, involved in, in, and allowed us to be engaged in the process of developing the tool um, and uh, has, has, has listened to feedback from our users and our teachers. So people like Gretchen and, and others have been able to guide the development from an educator's perspective. 
Uh, and we think it's just a great tool and we're, we're hopeful that uh, all of you get a chance to try it out. So I will stop sharing and turn it back to questions. Thank you, Tyson. And it's, uh, it's been a pleasure working with National Geographic for me. I remember Tyson, when we first, we first engaged, it took me about a year to get to you of working through the hierarchy of Nat Geo's at the headquarters and had to kind of go down through producers and these folks and these folks, and they said no, and they said no, and eventually you said yes. <laughs> and that was, uh, that was the beginning of, of really taking CMOC out of that Arizona State University development effort with some students into the real world. And, and we really appreciate everything you've done for us. And you're, you're infinitely patient with all of my emails that I send you. So I appreciate it. Guy's emails are fascinating. He's always doing something. The guy is interested in so many things. And uh, I get to follow along vicariously. So I really appreciate him. Thank you. So I think Q&A at this point um, for, for any one of us or for the use of CMOC itself, does anybody have any questions or comments? Here's just a comment that came in from Karen um, that she's been using CMOC in her science classes for three years. She said it's very engaging. So Karen, where are you? Where do you teach? What? Um, I teach in Brunswick, Maine. Um, so we integrated it into the eighth grade curriculum um, the first year that um, we received an email to try it out and give feedback from our students and we've done it every year. Um, and this year we made it like a um, culminating project. So each unit we're doing all year is building students up to do a big um, design their own Mars colony project to wrap up eighth grade. Very cool. I need to circle back to you and, and get your full story of how you've been using it because I recognize you can put it on the website as well. So it's good to hear. Yeah. From you. And also, she has a few boys. Yeah, there's this simulation, Simo, accounts for the fact that Mars has one third of the gravity of Earth, which affects everything like land growth and human development and strength and uh, nutrition and, and the fact that humans they will lose a ton of weight and plants will grow at a different rate because of the different gravitational strength on Mars? It's a really good question. Thank you. Um, at this point in time, the CMOX simulation does not take into account those uh, the, the, the reduced gravitational field in part because we don't really know what, the, what will happen. There's no way it's impossible to simulate one third gravity on Earth. We can simulate greater strengths by putting things into a centrifuge, for instance, but it's impossible to simulate for long duration a reduced gravitational field. So we understand plant growth in microgravity, which is on orbit, and we understand plant growth in one full gravity in one G. And that in between phase, we don't really know what, the, what will happen. Plants, some plants might do better, some plants might do worse, um, some plants may not care at all. Um, so it's a really good question, but we are currently in, in an arduous process. Um, Ezio and uh, Grant, and we have five students working us from Arizona State University. So we have a nine person team now, and we are completely rebuilding the entire back end engine to CMOC in order to enable uh, a future much more dynamic model so that we can more easily introduce these things as we learn about what those potentials will be. One of the things we're introducing, which we're really excited about, is the ability to stagger your plant harvest. So as you saw in that final demonstration I gave where we had six different kinds of plants, and there's a point at which there's just too many plants and not enough humans. Well, if we had staggered the crop production such that maybe we harvest this one and then wait two weeks before we plant it again, we can actually smooth out that cycle. And so that's, that's just natural. It's what you do in a greenhouse anyway. So we're introducing the ability for the user to say, well, I want to stagger this. So maybe a one month delay between when I harvest the radishes and when I plant them again to try to smooth some of that cycle out so they're all growing at the same time. So that's the kind of fidelity that we're introducing into the next version of CMOC. Hopefully within the next six months, we'll be able to launch that. It looks very good, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would, in, in addition to staggering the start of a uh, a plant lifespan, could you also stagger or uh, change the harvest process so that you don't harvest, for example, the, the radishes all at once, you just harvest a row of them? No, that's a good question. I think if you were to harvest, I see what you're saying. And so with there's, you know, all plants have a certain window, like tomatoes, for instance, is usually about two or three months in which you can harvest tomatoes. So that's a really good point. Um, 
I'm going to pass that off to Ezio. <laughs> Ezio, I think we'd have to, it's a really good point. I think we'd have to actually introduce multiple strawberry or multiple tomato agents that we stagger the agent itself. Um, but that's a good point. I'm going to make a note of that. I think it can be done. It shouldn't be too difficult. Yeah. Good answer. That I hire the best. <laughs> I have a question for the instructors out there. Um, as we transition back into physical classrooms in, in many arenas, um, Gretchen, you said that it was even more exciting to be in class and see the students using it in person. But I also know that within our within our North America, at least in the United States, there's there's relative. If I understand correctly, there's quite a bit of confines. There's, you're really expected to produce certain results from the students. And so how hard is it for you, um, Karen or, or Gretchen, to, to modify this, this standards curriculum, these standards, and actually interject your own creative solutions? And you know, is it difficult to do that within those, within those uh, definitions? Um, I haven't had a tr any trouble at all integrating it in. So I've been using a lot of um, different resources. Like I use the CIMOC. But um, because a lot of the, at least our curriculum standards have a lot of that critical thinking involved in it. And so we're really good at working that in there because the CIMOC is set up to um, harness that critical thinking skill in many different levels. Cool. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, it really just depends on what the focus is that you take and um, the curriculum materials have so many activities already, but even if you needed to fine tune it to one particular standard, so many different areas of science are integrated with CMOC and, and, and just going along with what Tyson was talking about, um, just connections between everything. Um, I, I just think it just takes focus um, by the teacher, in fact, just going back to the question before about gravity, that came up in my English class the other day and, and we were um, speaking with a scientist from Cornell. Um, I do that Skype a scientist program and her research is, um, she part of her research is she sent soil to um, the International Space Station to test the processes um, and the effect of gravity. So um, exactly what Karen said, I think it just takes I think you could integrate it with anything, honestly, because it's all relative. One of the things I'd like to add as we as we start to come towards our close is that both in CMOC and in the actual Mars habitat we're building here at Biosphere 2. And I, I open this and I'd like to close with it as well, is that when when you learn about these these kind of discrete functions, when you learn about how much carbon dioxide a human produces per hour per day. And you learn that if you eat a cinnamon roll for breakfast, you produce more carbon dioxide for the next four hours than if you have eggs for breakfast. So if you're <laughs> if you're in a mission critical environment and your CO2 scrubbers working don't we're not working very well, no one gets to eat sugar for breakfast. <laughs> you, got, you got to conserve. But it really gets you thinking about those direct functions. Your body, even though you're relatively small compared to the whole planet, your body is in fact affect in fact affecting the world around you and and so you know our bodies our cars our houses our air conditioning units it's everything we do affects and and one of the first things you learn if you study astronomy or, or earth and space sciences is that the atmosphere is really really thin and the best analogy i like to use is that if the if the atmosphere of the earth if the earth were a globe you know say a globe about this big a globe of the earth the atmosphere is the thickness of the shellac of the lacquer if the, if the earth were a basketball, it'd be one third, the atmosphere that we can breathe is one third the thickness of a sheet of paper wrapped around that basketball. It's really, really <laughs> small. And so I think that, that one of the, the best takeaways from CMOC, yes, it's exciting to get into space exploration, it's exciting to think about becoming interplanetary, but my, myself through this last four or five years of learning, I've learned so much about human metabolism and about plant ecology and about animal husbandry and about all the things and all the ways that these are all connected and what it really takes to, to wrap all that into a recycling system. It takes recycling to a whole new level. It's not just about aluminum here and plastic here and paper here. It's about every single function of our life. 
and and that when we when we lock people inside this this thing behind me, when we lock people inside that in April of next year, they have to live like that. There's there is no throwaway. There is no place to put things. There is no landfill. Everything they bring in stays in for the duration of their mission. Every bit of air they breathe is going to be recycled. And so that's also a shout out to all of you that uh, we will be accepting research teams to SAM um, starting in April, May next year. And of, of all age groups, if they're younger than 18, of course, they need to have an adult you know, chaperone with them. But it's open to, to everyone. So we should get a brophy team. <laughs> I can do that. Excellent. I do, yeah. Excellent. I'm sure I can bring students over there. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll do a field trip. Yeah, we'll talk. A two week, a two week field trip. We lock them in, then you can be free of your students for two. Ah, uh, that'll be awesome. You, you guys go to this experiment. I'm gonna take a two week vacation, and I'll come back pick you up in two weeks at this. Yeah. <laughs> Hope you make it. Hope you have enough radishes. Hope you make it. it. Don't kill each other, right? <laughs> We'll do a retreat. We call it a retreat. Yeah, they go in and you retreat. <laughs> Good. Um, Anything else before we before we wrap up? Well, I just want to add my appreciation to both the team that presented and the people that participated. I think a request is, you know, in each of your own networks, share this information, share the links and um, encourage your uh, fellow teachers to start, you know, to check out CMOC. But a special shout out to Corey, who's the um, executive director for the ELEA, which is our um, system of um, for schools um, in the Lutheran Church, um, of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. So um, thank you again. And um, the reason in part I'm here because I served on the board and I'm passionate about education and I'm also Kai's mom. So, hey, it's a win-win. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Kai, Gretchen, and Ty for being here and sharing all of this information. Um, you know, the one thing that I wrote really huge in my notes was authentic science. I think that's amazing. Um, and to be able to bring this opportunity to so many um, children in our schools, I think is uh, got such great potential. So um, thank you again. I will make sure that everybody who registered does get um, a link to the recording. Kai, I will get the uh, recording to you and then let you take it from there. And I will also include uh, the resources that were posted in our chat today. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone right. for attending and for, and for Corey for putting this together. Appreciate it. And thanks mom. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.